So, Jello. Right, right, right. It's a solid, it's a liquid, it's a viscoelastic polymer made of polypeptide chains. Would you eat it? I mean, it tastes good. <laughs> Why do you do that? Do what? Say something super smart and then bail from it. Can you keep a secret? No. But, but, but this time, sure, yeah. Okay, well, it was a really long time ago, but I, too, was a nerd. Two? When I was a little girl, I wore a ponytail, I had glasses, and I was totally obsessed with the science of weather. Other girls wanted a Barbie. I wanted a Doppler Weather Radar 2000 Turbo. But all the kids used to taunt me with this lame song. It wasn't even clever. Four eyes, four eyes, you need glasses to see. <laughs> Go on. So I got a new look, gave up the sciencey smart stuff, and I was never made fun of again. And I still need these glasses, but I never wear them. I'll bet you look great with glasses on. Oh, I'm really And on them. they go. Oh. Whoa. What? Nothing. Wait. It's a jello scrunchie. And now, the reveal. Wow. I mean, you were okay before, but now, you're beautiful. No, I'm not. I can't go out in public like well, this. Why not? I mean, this is the real you, right? Smart, bespectacled. Who wouldn't want to see that? Good afternoon, everyone. Anyone that has talked to me in the last two weeks knows that I'm very excited to introduce the panelists for today's discussion on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM. Growing up, I was never encouraged to pursue math or science because my thing was supposed to be social studies and writing. So as someone who's just recently discovered her passion for coding and technology policy, it is an honor to stand on the stage with these women who are such an inspiration to any little girl or in my case, a not so little 21-year-old college student that wants to take the math, the science, or technology world by storm. As Helen said earlier, Carrie Swisher will be moderating this panel. She is currently the co-executive editor of Recode and co-executive producer of the Code Conference. She previously worked for the Wall Street Journal covering digital issues starting in 1997 and was the co-executive uh, co -executive editor of All Things D. Kara's a fellow Hoya, and so we're very excited to have her back on the hilltop today. Megan Smith is an entrepreneur, tech evangelist, engineer, and catalyst and connector. As a VP at Google X, Megan works on a range of projects, including co-creating slash hosting Solve for X to encourage and amplify technology-based moonshot thinking and collaboration. For nine years prior, she led Google's new business development team, managing early style partnerships, pilot explorations, and technology licensing for, global, uh, for Google's global engineering and product teams. She led the acquisition of Keyhole, which became Google Earth, um, Where to Tech, which we know is Google Maps, and Picasa. She also led the Google.org team's transition to add more engineering with the Google Crisis Response, Google for Nonprofits, um, Earth Outreach slash Engine, and increased employment engagement. Prior to joining Google, Megan was CEO and earlier COO of Planet Out, the leading LGBT online community, where the team broke through barriers and partnered closely with AOL, Yahoo, and MSN, MSN and other major web players, and was an early at General Magic and, Japan, and Apple Japan. Also, very cool, she was a member of the MIT student team who designed, built, and raced a solar car 2,000 miles across the Australian outback. <laughs> Reshma Sajani is the founder and CEO of Girls Who Code and a former deputy public advocate for New York City. As executive director for the public fund for Ad for public of the Fund for Public Advocacy, Sajani uh, brought together public and private sectors to encourage entrepreneurship and civic engagement across NYC. 
Today, she has galvanized industry leaders to close gender gap in STEM education and empower girls to pursue careers in technology and engineering. In 2012, she became the first South Asian woman to run for Congress, promoting smarter policies to spur innovation and job creation. Advocating for a new model of female leadership focused on risk-taking, competition, and mentorship, Sirjani also is the author of a new book entitled Women Who Don't, Want, Who Don't Wait in Line. Dr. Yvonne Cagle is a member of the astronaut class of 1996. She is currently assigned to Johnson Space Center's Space and Life Sciences Directorate. Dr. Cagle is also an advisor for NASA's Flight Opportunities Program. Currently, Dr. Cagle is on faculty and serves as, a NASA, as the NASA liaison for the exploration and space development with Singularity University. During the workshop, uh, Dr. Cagle was embedded with the crew as a crew training consultant and advisor, providing insight and feedback to both crew and study team from the viewpoint of an astronaut, providing insights and feedback for both the crew and study team um, as an astronaut, a flight surgeon, space development expert, and science liaison. She has recently been selected to uh, selected reserve crew for Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation, which is part of a study uh, for NASA to determine the best way to keep astronauts well nourished during multiple year missions to Mars or to the moon. And so as you can see, we have an amazing group of very accomplished women, um, and I'm sure it will produce a wonderful discussion uh, of how to own it in STEM industries. So please give a warm welcome to our panelists. Gosh, after listening to all those bios, I'm, I'm, I feel adequately inadequate right now. <laughs> so, um, and later afterwards, we're going to figure out what went wrong in gravity, um, <laughs> and then rebuild it. <laughs> anyway, um, so we're going to talk a lot about STEM, but it's actually STEAM. Megan likes to call it STEAM, which includes arts, um, which we're tr a lot of people are trying to change the term because it should also include arts among uh, science, uh, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and which is pretty much everything. Um, so <laughs> history, STEM, huh, kind of thing, STEAM, huh, um, or huh, STEAM. Anyway, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about where we are right now, especially with girls uh, and women in this area, because uh, it's really quite depressing when you're in, in much of the tech industry, and uh, not as much in science, but still throughout, uh, throughout the various industries that are becoming increasingly important for people. <laughs> Um, but first, I want to talk about how you got into tech, each of you. What was the, what, how did you stay in tech or stay in science as opposed to moving out of it, which happens to a lot of girls around, I think it's eight years old, is when things begin to happen. Why don't we start with you? Uh, um, for me, it was always just being curious, always wanting to know the answer and never being satisfied until I could actually experience it firsthand. And uh, I, I continued to pursue that and found that after I became a doctor and learned all about the human body and gravity, I naturally began to wonder what happens when you take it to high speeds, to depth, to high altitudes. Became a flight surgeon in the Air Force, went fast in fighter performance jets, and suddenly felt that it wasn't going fast enough or high enough and wanted to take it naturally off planet, out of the atmosphere. But even then, I couldn't get the answers that I wanted and knew the only way to experience those answers was to find out what it was like firsthand. And I've continued to do that through the years, and now I'm ready to take it not just off planet and into the atmosphere, but to actually look towards colonization and see if we can actually not just travel, but relocate and colonize in places beyond our planet of origin. Wow, OK. Um, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's go. Yeah. Woo. Um, by the way, best outfit of the day. Really. <laughs> thank much. you. Thank you. I thank like you. Judy Smith's shoes, uh, the <laughs> Olivia Pope's shoes, but this is working it a lot better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, but I want to talk about when you were younger. Was there a price for that? Your interest in science, or was it celebrated by you? Who who allowed you to feel good about doing that? Because a lot of girls. Do, there's a shift. There's a major shift for many, many girls. Well, I've, I've noticed that shift. Um, when I was a young girl a few years ago, um, it was a very different tone. There weren't very many role models out. And of course, Sally Ride, Mae Jamison's were really my flagship for me. But you found that as you elected to go in those STEM, STEAM directions, that you began to lose a sense of community and connection. Um, you lost the chatter, the conversation and you really had to navigate your own way. 
So as a young girl, I found that um, I felt the trade-off was that I lost some community. Mm -hmm. And if I wasn't just so curious and so um, tenacious, I think it might have you know, eventually taken me away. Was there a person? <sighs> there, were, there was a person. There were mentors. There were people. But primarily for me, they were my ancestors because I felt like they had sacrificed so much that I truly was standing on the shoulders of giants. And what really inspired me was what a privilege it was, how, fought that privilege, how hard that privilege was fought. And I felt like I really had a responsibility to represent and to make sure that those lives weren't sacrificed in vain. Um, so full disclosure, I, I am not an engineer or a hacker or a computer scientist. Uh, I am majored in political science. Uh, went to the University of Illinois kind of in the heyday of all the technological stuff that was happening there. Um, you know, my family came here as refugees from Uganda. And what's interesting is both my parents are engineers. And I think one of the reasons why they got safe passage to come to this country in the 70s is that we had an enormous dearth of engineers during that time period. And I distinctly remember sitting around, you know, the dinner table and my father would say, what's two plus two? And I swore it was five over and over again, and him just giving me that look, like, like you're clear, you know, how are you my daughter, almost. Um, and I felt terrified of it, terrified of math and science, and I was immediately kind of excelled in debate classes and, you know, on the other side of things. So, you know, when I started Girls Who Code, I was very much aware of, in some ways, the fact that, like, as you know, I came at it as a, as a politician. I was running for office. When you're running for office, you go to a lot of schools, you meet a lot of parents, and I really saw the technology divide kind of up close and personal in New York City. And I'm a feminist with a capital F, and it's clear where the jobs are going to be and that women at this rate are not going to be a part of that growth. But I also kept thinking about, you know, as someone who sees themselves as a disruptor in politics, I want to be able to go home and revamp my own website or build that app to help undocumented students, you know, get, you know, fill out their DACA papers. And I, and I couldn't do it. Um, and that's in many ways what really inspired me um, to start Girls Who Code. And I have mandated that everybody in my organization learn how to computer program. So yesterday we had a, you know, a three hour class on Scratch trying to make a video game. And I was taken back to the child at 11 on the dinner Explain table. Explain Scratch for those kids. So Scratch is basically many, it, it, I guess it's, in some ways it's kind of programming for young people. When, you know, it's kind of the basics when you start off and um, anyone should learn it. Everybody in this room should go experiment with it. Um, but you learn basically different commands and variables. So one of the things that we're learning right now is how to create a video game where you hit the ball and the ball hits the paddle and how to make that happen. And it, it, remind, it took me back to, again, how I felt when I was 12, because I wanted the answer immediately. And I didn't want to sit with it and kind of talk myself through how you solve a problem. And it became very frustrating. But that's kind of where we need to sit at. Megan? Um, it's interesting, the story of your dad, because I think one of the issues is that sort of the engineers and math folks who teach our kids are doing it the same way that's not attracting whole chunks of kids. It's making kids feel like they're dumb or feel like, yeah. and he didn't mean to do that, but like if he had just grabbed some oranges on yeah. the table and put two of them here and said, you know, if I've got two oranges and you want more and there's two over here, what would they be if they're, you know, whatever he did to make it applied and valuable and useful in the world um, would have made a big difference for your interest level, I think. And I think that was something that I was lucky to have. So I went to a really cool inner city uh, magnet school in Buffalo um, and our teachers, uh, they just made us do hands-on projects a lot. And that was true both in history and English and, and that as well as in all the STEAM fields. And so that was helpful for me. I, it was the time of sort of Carter into Reagan and, and uh, the energy crisis was there. So one of the, just as both on me personally and in general, we did a, uh, some research recently at Google where we looked at what, what the kids who were opting out were saying. And really this whole set of girls and actually a set of boys who feel like they want to have impact in the world. And the way they've been being asked what's two plus two isn't telling them this math and science has impact, even though we can sort of see it, they're not seeing it. And so they opt out. 
Um, and so we were lucky because uh, I wanted to work on green energy and the energy crisis because we were having a lot of problems at the time. So all of my science fair projects, which was mandatory in our school to do science fair, um, were all in solar energy and wind and these areas. And so I'd have to go to the library and sort of debug and figure out what that was. And so the, the experience of making something yourself um, is the most important fundamental experience for people in research that people who've come into the STEM or STEAM fields, they, um, they have had the experience of being in the shop. And it's, I think it's, the analogy for me is, in school we teach reading and we teach writing. We would never teach kids not to write, not to express or create. But we seem very happy to like, have kids just ingest science and math and not do it. And, and it's a huge problem for our country. It's a problem in the world because we need more people to be fluent in these languages. You know, even if you don't, if you want to write plays and you don't want to do stuff, but to know about it, you'll write better science characters. You know, and or if you're in Congress and you're not doing STEAM, you'll just make better policy. You'll make better energy policy for the country, etc. If you actually are more fluent. So, let's talk about why, especially women opt out, what happens. Now, you did science fairs. You, you, there was, if you look at clips from Megan's mother says, um, she, she won every other year. Uh, she won all the solar years, and then the wind guy won the other years. And so they would, you know, Megan would make a solar toaster. He'd make a wind dishwasher. She'd make a solar. <laughs> and then she got to the car, ultimately. But it was interesting to, to, the, that that was valuable to you, for example, or any of you. But there's a moment, what happens, do you think, Vaughn, maybe you could talk about what happens to people and what can do, we do to change that? Because obviously you liked winning these science fairs, but sometimes that's not a good thing to win a science fair necessarily. You know, um, STEAM is really its own language. And there's a time when that language is gender blind. And when you're kids, you're all running around discovering and having fun and a great time. And somewhere along the way, that gets culturized out of us. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that with that, when that happens, but it's not that we have to get something back in terms of a language. We as young girls growing into women, we don't lose that language. We actually change the dialect of it. And so I think if we understand that the language is still there, we still speak that same language, that same joy, but we find different ways to apply it, as you said, Megan, different ways to have it represented in our lives, and then different ways to share it amongst ourselves and build community around that chatter, I think that's a way we can gain sustainability. I have two things I want to add about this, and it goes back to the clip that we saw. I think that the role of pop culture in this is really important. And I think that age that studies have shown where it switches is around that kind of seventh and eighth grade, when you start being you know, very aware that you're, a boy, you're, you're, that you're a girl and that there are boys out there. And when I think about, for me, you know, in the 1970s, 10% of all doctors and lawyers were women. Think about that, 10%. So in 40 years, that number is now 45%. Well, what happened? I knew I wanted to be a lawyer, and none of you know what I'm going to talk about, but when I saw Jodie Foster in The Accused, mm -hmm. I just thought that she was so hot and so cool, and I was like, I want to be her. And Wait, uh, Kelly McGillis was the duck. Uh, sorry, the Kelly McGillis in, yeah. in The Accused. Yeah, yeah, right, Jodie Foster Jody Foster's character. You, you didn't want, want right. to be her. But, the, right. <laughs> Well, no, it's um, well, brave, but uh, still. very brave. Um, but, but when you think about the 70s, 80s, and 90s, yes, we had you know, favorable policies by Reagan. We had Title IX. But we also had LA Law and Grey's Anatomy, right? And you constantly were flooded with positive caricatures of women who were doctors and lawyers. And girls really saw them and said, you know what? I, I can do that, too. We don't have that today. You know, we can have a conversation about gravity, but you know, we, when you think about HBO show Silicon Valley, when you yeah. think about the latest Staples ad, when if anybody watched the Super Bowl and saw the Volkswagen commercial, there are constantly. Barbie had a doll ten years ago that says, "I hate math." I can walk into Forever Twenty One and buy a T-shirt that says, "I'm allergic to algebra." There are constantly messages every day, and if you're, if you'll now notice them even more so now that I've said this, every day that are saying to girls. Math and science is not for you. Technology is not for you. And they're listening. And so it really begins with you know, thinking about how do we put those positive images, even those subtle images, out there. Secondly, you know, when I go, around, I go around the country and talk to high school girls all the time trying to get the answer to this question, and they do really feel like, there's in, like there is pressure by the boys and essentially this attitude that like, computers are not for you. 
And you know, we had an interesting um, situation come out. There's a huge hackathon happening in California called HS Hacks, mm -hmm. right? And if you look at the website, mostly all boys. One of our girls at Girls Who Code, Amanda Chen, said, you know what, I'm gonna join. And so she got on the leadership team. And you know, as she got on, she started, you know, the boys were not so nice. And instead of saying, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get off of it, she went to the Girls Who Code Facebook group and said, you know what, let's all join. And they all joined. And they changed the entire culture of it. And so that, like, there needs to be a critical mm -hmm. mass, right, of young women in this industry that are also changing the culture. Well, it's interesting, although even with that clip, she was happy when he thought she was pretty. You know what I mean? There was a moment which was, I thought was interesting, and in Gravity, the man say, you this, know what I mean? Right, the, she the, needed, the space cowboy. Right, right that savior, what was the her. single best joke of all time was that it, it proved that George Clooney uh, can't spend enough, that much time with a woman that he has to float away in space. <laughs> his own age, his woman his own age, he has to float away in space and die, uh, rather than spend time with women his own age. But which was a great joke. But again, those were they were suggestive of not, you know, of course, like she wasn't getting down by the way in a real life situation. Correct? Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. Thank you. She wasn't going to land on planet Earth. And be okay. That was, that was a rough right. one. Anyway, rough one. But who <laughs> managed that one? But, um, but, uh, but again, that was another one where there was not just her. You know what I mean? It was he kind had of to save her. Right. Right. And, right. and you really, I mean, did you get that sense too? Yeah, I got that sense. And it's funny because the training, you're not really thinking about being rescued. Right. You know, you all know you're a bold face. You all know your checklist. And right. you've got more than enough to keep you occupied without reflecting upon where's my knight in shining armor coming to rescue right. me. So a right. little bit of, you know, a... a a diversion there, but yeah, it's um, why couldn't she save him? Right. It, it's, a, it's a just a funny thing that that Hollywood actually, because of the great divide of not actually having the experiences of making these things and doing these things and being in the, um, many of the people write the characters in very incorrectly. Like even this is not a gender thing, but the the movie The Social Network. Mm. So they have Mark Zuckerberg, and he's sort of there's a premise uh, in the movie that he's doing it for a girl. Like, the, if all the techies I know, all the founders I know, they're not, they're just obsessed with their idea. They're like passionate, crazy people. We don't, they're not doing it for those reasons. So there's this idea in Hollywood that there's this extra romance piece that has to be written in. And so the girls somehow are suffering. We've been doing a lot of work with Gina Davis. I don't know if people are familiar with the Gina Davis Institute, but Gina was watching television with her kids when they were younger, and she just noticed as an actress how biased it was, and she kept pointing it out, and people saying, no, it's fine, there's Dora, there's the Scooby-Doo girls, there's plenty of balance, and she's like, no. Scooby-Doo girls. Um, <laughs> and so she actually now, went come to. Come Daphne is stupid and Belma's a lesbian, so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Okay. Um, so, am I right? <laughs> Thank you. But what she did was she went to USC Annenberg, and they actually counted, they sat and counted, and it's a three to one boys or men to, on screen to girls in children's TV. And 80% of the characters held in children's television are held by male characters. So it's not even the seventh and eighth graders. It's the two, three, four, five, six-year-olds learning. Gina calls it boys will be boys and girls will be boys. I mean, look at Rio just came out this week, right? Every character on the posters is a boy. Um, in the film Nemo, how many women in the ocean? Any guesses? Whole ocean. There's Remember the sharks, the turtles? The, there's one. Now, would that work? No. There's um, one. <laughs> there, there's also, by the way, there's one, and she's nuts. She's yeah. Nuts. Although she's a good character. But she's so, a good character. But one of the things, so here's, here's an interesting thing. You, if you have computer science skills, you can do something we're doing with Gina's team. So we're working with the USC computer science team. We've added them into the, we gave her a million dollars to do this. They're now, this great team is looking at um, running videos through more of an app and actually looking at faces on screen, who gets what screen time? They're now tagging the voices. I think it's going to be more eight to one when we tag and see who speaks. They're also looking at what music is playing for girls and boys. And so can we reveal the data of what's happening? And it's not that, it's sort of a critical point here is not that Hollywood means to be doing this. They grew up with the same film, so they have the same propaganda. We have an issue at Google where, you know the doodles? So we discovered through great stuff coming at us from the web that for seven years we celebrated near zero birthdays of women. Seven years. Would Google have done that? No, right? That, that's not something we would have done consciously. So we've been doing unconscious bias training and learning, 
And through a combination of things, last couple of years we're at 50-50 now, and you're starting to, you'll notice it. It's a lot more on women's birthdays. Part of the reason for that is because we're celebrating people who are no longer alive. History, uh, Gloria Steinem says, history um, always included and was equal part by women, uh, but just not history at equal. So, so the Newton and these guys are being celebrated, and history is just very biased, so we were biased. So you, you have to work to wake up. And I think one of the greatest breakthroughs is Harvey Mudd. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's different things that are happening, K-12, university, professionally. At the university level, computer science is about 15% women. Physics also. These are the two groups that are not breaking through. The rest of the fields, you know, biology, chemi, mechanical engineering, my field, even. But there's also a decline. So there were, in, in 1984, 37% of all computer science graduates were women. So it's really interesting that as we are becoming more technologically advanced, and as the consumption of digital is increasing by women, it's going the other way. I had a very depressing conversation with Leslie Stahl, and she was saying that, in the same thing that's happening with medicine, that as professions become less prestigious, as people make less, you see women go into them. Mm -hmm. And as they become more prestigious, and there's more money, women are, are left behind. You know, it, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to look and, and see if, that, if that's the case. But I think one of the most important things that we see in Girls Who Code is that most girls don't even know what computer science is or what it does. Um, when I think about my parents, like, I, they're both engineers. I still don't know what they do. You know, they never took me to work, right? We, there, there is this really, if you don't have role models in your life who actually took the effort to show you that, I think that many girls don't go into this field because it's true. I think what Megan said is that 75% of high school girls want to change the world. They don't want to make money, right? So boys can look at the social network and be like, I want to be Mark Zuckerberg and make $100 million. Women are like, I want to change the world. And so what we've done at Girls Who Code is really show girls how you can build things, how you can create things. Like, do you have a problem you want to solve? And what we've ended up with is girls who are building algorithms to help fight bullying before it even happens. You know, they're, they're building uh, algorithms to help solve world hunger or fight obesity or find a cure to cancer. Um, they're finding the role of computer science in whatever industry it is, whether you want to be Beyonce, you know, and DJing now happens not on turntables table, but on iPads, right? They're applying it to whatever it is that you want so to do. And we're, we're converting talk, girls. Talk about that, that idea of Mark Zuckerberg. I want to be Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. So there's, there was, I was doing uh, an interview and uh, a VC, I was saying, how is it that your entire firm is all men? It's just interesting to me that suddenly you're, how, is, how did this happen? And it happens every, and I ask every VC when I interview them, how did this happen? And, you know, they're like, oh, we're looking for the best people. And I'm like, and they're all white men. And then, <laughs> and then an Asian, an Indian, you know, I mean, a, a, a yeah. Chinese, a Korean, Indian, and that's it. You right. know what I mean? One. Right. There's only one or two. It's fascinating to watch because you can actually... They did make a good joke on Silicon Valley. They were like, oh, there's two white guys, there's an Indian and Asian, and they, they travel in packs, yeah. and they must move around, yeah. and so they create these little groups, <laughs> um, uh, which is interesting, um, which is very true, actually, when you start to pay attention to it. But, but the idea of this idea of who you look up to is really difficult. And so I was in this meeting, and this VC said, he goes, well, you know, and I said, well, what, you know, if there were, why don't you find more women? Can you not find them? Are you that dumb? Or do you need help? Or something like that. And he said, he goes, well, if there was, if there was a Marsha Zuckerberg, he really said that. Marsha Zuckerberg. If there was a Marsha Zuckerberg, maybe, maybe people would think more of women in, in tech. And I was like, well, do you want me to list all the failures you've backed, or of, of which right. they were all men names, I, right. I believe? And so it was a really interesting thing that there has to be a Marsha Zuckerberg somewhere. Well, which, I mean, that, can, can you imagine Mark as a woman? But that's another issue. I mean, not, but, <laughs> and I won't, I mean, I won't name names, but you know, when I started, I, you know, I took a year and a half to create Girls Who Code before I launched it. And there was many a male venture, BC, who said to me, or entrepreneurs, prominent ones, that said, Freshman, there's just an aptitude issue. Girls yeah, so are just it's, it's, not as good at it. And if you, you know, would go through the whole you know, curve and where girls are and where boys are, and they were experts on it because they had built these companies and seen it year after year after year. I mean, it's bullshit. It is. But they there's, really, there's really, really yeah. believe it. They really, really, really believe it. There's a, um, there's a crazy statistic from computer science high school teachers that we've come across that 70% of the computer science high school teachers think boys are better than girls at coding despite overwhelming evidence. 
And so it's, it's systemic, and we just have to work on it. The, the breakthrough at Harvey Mudd that I wanted to share is uh, Maria Clawe is the president there, and she gave sort of an open space for her faculty to reinvent the begin computer science curriculum. And they changed it in a way that it just became more attractive to everyone. And it now is the only department that's at 50-50, and it's uh, got more minorities in, and just it's more popular. They changed it to creative problem solving, and they did they, they asked questions, why are you not doing this? And they found three objections by, by the girls that were going in, and some of the boys who also were like, I want to have impact, so I'm going to Congress, I'm not going to STEM. Um, they said, I, I, um, I don't think it has impact. I won't be good at it. I don't want to hang out with those people. So they said, so they, <laughs> that is an excellent reason. But <laughs> I have to hang out, I have to hang with those people all the time. No. So the, with the ones about interest, they just changed the homework. So instead of saying like, please do this computation about fractals, they said, you know, we need to deliver drugs to this group of people yeah. who are not, you know, this problem, we have this, some reason to do it. And this, either one needs a sort routine. Right, so, and then, so they just did really clever rework of how they walked in. They didn't walk in and start with numbers, they started with reasons. The second thing they did was they split the class. Many people can get to college now with, you know, five to ten years of computer science experience. And so they, their colors are black and gold, so they decided black would be elite programmers, gold would be new. And so if you've already programmed, please come here, the other group here. So the confidence was, it just shifted it up. They also coached the show-off boys to stop doing that. It's not good for their careers. And it was just better for everybody if they just were more of a coach. They could show off by coaching. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing that they did was they found that the sooner you actually are in the field, it dispels all the stereotypes. And so they could get you an internship or a research project, take you to the Grace Hopper Conference where 5,000 women computer science gather every fall. And it just changed things up. The same thing, the number one source of African-American software engineers to Google's University of Maryland, they did the same thing with their students. They, they do something called look to your right, look to your left, every one of you will be here. So they just help them. And then they, then they say, yeah, they don't weed them out. And the second is we'll get in the field. And the sooner they're in the field, they're just, we are odd in our industry, but we're good odd, not, not Big Bang Theory odd. So, <laughs> so people so, have fun. So let's talk more about those solutions because you know, still persistent is that those sh one show off, you do see that among those programmers. And secondly, is, is I don't know if it's a juvenile attitude, because I, I like to not think it's completely anti-female, um, because it's not as malicious as some of it is, by the way. Some of it is quite malicious. When you see like stories pop up in Silicon Valley, gender issues and stuff like that, some of it is just inane and juvenile. And so what's interesting is how you solve that. For example, like I always get like, these programmers make jokes about, you know, dip, I want to put a disc in your drive, or whatever, you know, drive in your disc. And I'm literally like, what? Like, that is stupid. That is a bad joke. If you're going to make a computer joke, like, about sex, you need to do, raise, the, raise, raise, the, the bar. raise the bar. And so that's how I deal with it, when they start to move in that area and stuff like that. I'm like, that's a bad joke. Here's three more, and I have much better ones. And so, and by the way, there's a lot. Um, there's a lot in poking, Facebook. Facebook alone, you could spend months uh, making sex jokes. Um, but, but how do you, what is your solution, say, where you are, when you're in a largely male environment, again, also? Uh, a couple of things. One, remember my um, uh, aspiration to go to space was because I wanted to decode the human body. I wanted to see where the heart floats in the human body. When a, when a doctor says, hey, I don't hear it over to the left, then where did it go? The person's still alive, and oh, it flows to the center of the chest. So that opens up a whole realm of possibilities. But I think um, one of the things is making STEAM not a destination, but a journey, making it a tool to an end. And we're all very globally conscious, and there's something that's very collaborative about raising global consciousness and being part of that global problem solving. It's sort of a, a you know, levels of the playing field there. So I think one of the things is exactly like what you were saying, is to make a condition that is globally relevant to everyone, where everyone wants to come together and everyone benefits from the solution. The other thing I would recommend is maybe making the problem itself bigger than any one person or show out can solve. And 22 years in the Air Force, we did our share of confidence courses. And you have people of all sizes, genders, everything, trying to scale over some wall that on the other side has a big mud pit. And it's never pretty, it's never glamorous, but it really takes everybody in different roles being able to have either the brute strength or the finesse to be able to get over that mud pit. 
And so the show outs tend to be um, um, flagged because they show back up at the barracks covered in mud. And then the other teams that are more of the set off to the side, sidebarred, are the ones who are at dinner eating already showered, getting all the food, while the mud-soaked folks are still you know, back trying to get that off. So I think if you build that sense of confidence that it takes all of us, and that's the beauty of going off planet, is the only way we're all going to get back on planet is if we all you know, play a part and work together. And that's a very sobering thought when you realize that those six or seven people are really your true lifeline. It's not necessarily the tether that's on your suit, and it's not necessarily someone in a movie hanging on with brute force, right. but it really is the people that so make up your crew. So doing those courses, those are those courses you have to do. So it's not G.I. Jane where she just kicks their ass, which I like. Uh, That's what I thought, but yeah. I got my <clears throat> kicked enough, <laughs> okay. just caught myself. I like where are yes. It's so funny, you went, mm, and I said ass. But anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> that's why you were in the military, and I never would have gotten it. Um, that would have been funny. That would have been a funny movie. Uh, solutions, and then we're going to get some questions from you. You know, I think Megan had, had, was kind of spot on. I mean, I think, you know, it really is one about confidence building. You know, we had our girls make presentations to Sheryl Sandberg. You know, they were just fearless and bold. And, like, they'll remember that moment, you know, when they're in their Stanford CS 101 class with one of these show-ups because they've had experiences that are now preparing them um, for that moment. So I think that, again, how can we, how can we like, if we could give the gift of confidence, I think a lot of the stuff that we're, we're seeing facing will, will, will really change. Okay, lastly, and then let's get some questions from the audience. It would be really great to have some questions. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, um, so practice makes permanent. And so I think you intervene in different ways, but K-12, definitely, especially K-3, you know, all hands-on stuff so the kids realize that this is fun, that they do it, that they can be good at it. It's not about the boys or girls. It's about everybody, team things which are really good to appreciate each other. Um, and also, I think, uh, and else, all the way through experiences, but also role models. So um, one of the things I've been working a lot on is the lost history of technical women and minorities. And a lot of people don't know that the first programmer in the world, the first person to think of programming, is Ada Lovelace in 1843, who was Lord Byron's poet math daughter. His, her uh, mother was afraid of her crazy poet dad and taught her all this math, and she thought of the idea of algorithms and programming, and she wrote that. It's an incredible uh, start. Or the ENIAC programmers, who are during World War II, Rosie the mathematician that you don't know about. There used to be a job called being a computer, and many women had that job. And then computers came, and they, they in fact, the NASA, um, Catherine Johnson, yes. I don't know if you know her, she, she was a computer at NASA and ended up calculating the trajectory. She's a 96-year-old African-American woman, amazing. Calculated Alan Shepard, John Glenn, and the Apollo mission. You've never heard of her. She calculated, um, explain what she calculated. She calculated the trajectories for, for these people to go and come they back. Didn't they, they didn't yeah, crash. So yeah, so that they came home. Right. And there's a great moment. That I got Dylan and the Makers team who are here, <coughs> but uh, to make, so there's a four minute video of Catherine. And there's a wonderful moment in it where she's looking at um, the team coming off the moon and she's like, we told them if they don't, if they get it wrong by one degree and we're whole across here, you know, we're like watching them and she's like, I hope they were right. And I thought, and I hope I'm right, too. <laughs> so, you know, we need to know about these heroes. The women and the minorities were never, you know, 50%. They were never the majority groups, but they were always there at the, the most elite Bletchley levels. Park. Yeah, Bletchley Park is uh, one of the coolest places I've come across. Um, it's probably the most profound diversity story in history. During World War II, um, you know, here you have the Nazis who've decided that a particular group of people is better than everyone, and they're actually killing people, and they've made their perfect Enigma code machine. And so all of their Bad. messages are encoded. Bad. But just this idea of, of stack-ranking humans and then people, this Aryan elite. And then on this other side, Churchill put a group of mathematicians together at Bletchley, which is about an hour, hour outside of London. I encourage you to go there when you, it's still there. Um, Cambridge and Oxford mathematicians, more than half women. It's Rosie the code cracker. And Turing was there. Turing's gay. There's like all these, it's like a Steve Jobs commercial of the misfits and crazies and all the things they did creatively. And they are credited with saving 11 million lives and shortening World War II by two years. Just an amazing feat. They of broke heroics. the Enigma code. Yeah, they broke, broke the codes first more manually and then with crunching type machines and then eventually inventing uh, the Colossus and computers. And there was a guy named Jerry, Captain Jerry Roberts, sitting, and the, all the veterans are 90 in their 90s, and you can still interact with them. He was sitting and he had decoded a message, he said, from Hitler. 
And he just said, you know, we were so creative during the war. Um, I met a woman there who was five years old on the park, and she said that she and her brothers and sisters were always like being too loud, and her mom was always saying, you know, they have this group of mathematicians next to them, shh, the girls are working, shh, the girls are working. I'm, wa I'm waiting for that film moment when you get to know about the girls working. But if we know these histories, we would realize that we've always been part of STEAM, and that STEAM is hugely important in what we do. The last story I'll tell you, which is a women's story that um, one of the coolest MIT alums is a woman named Catherine Dexter McCormick, who graduated in 1904 and became a suffragette. She was in biology. And she, and she ended up inheriting the American harvester for one of the big fortunes. And she had an incredible career. When in the 1950s, some people got some really interesting endocrinology ideas. And so they had basically the beginning of the birth control pill. And they couldn't get funding from anyone. And Catherine single-handedly gave them $2 million and funded that research because she understood the biology and the endocrinology and the, the science behind it. And if she didn't have that STEM background, she wouldn't have been in that team, which made profound difference for all of humanity from that point. So. Any questions from the audience? Is it on? Okay. Yeah. Um, my name is Sakina. I'm currently a junior here. And um, you mentioned that um, the disinterest in science that girls experience kind of happens around middle school, um, earlier third probably. grade, really young age, pretty yeah. much. And um, <laughs> I think for myself, um, having done a lot of research in high school, taken a lot of AP science classes, and finally coming to Georgetown, um, that's actually when my disinterest in, when my interest in science stopped. And it happened for me and a lot of my friends, um, a lot of my female friends who happen to be young women of color, and um, I'm not sure why it happened. I don't know if it was a confidence issue, not enough tutoring, um, or just something in the water. I don't know <laughs> what it is. Um, it wasn't that. But, <laughs> yeah. but a lot of our interests dropped because you know they were studying biochemistry, I was in biology and math, um, and it just stopped. And I wanna know, it, this is such an influential panel for you guys to be on. How do we get back into science after we've graduated? Um, I ended up declaring a major in philosophy, which I <coughs> think is awesome. Um, but if I want to get back into that, what would that look like? Second degree programs, post back programs, internships, like how do we reinstate ourselves into that environment? So um, I'd love to speak to that too as a woman of color. I mean, I think what happens, I know what happened to me when I got to college, my very first B and my only B I got was in chemistry. And once I got that B, I didn't take any more science classes because I wanted to graduate first in my class, which I did. And I think we just had, there was a great article in the Washington Post a couple weeks ago. We have to be okay with getting Bs and maybe even some Cs. But we have to just stick with it and stop opting out and feeling like we have to be perfect and have this perfect record. Um, I just think it's never too late. You know, I'm, I'm learning how to code right now. I'm 38. Uh, and it's frustrating and it's hard, but like I'm gonna stick with it and I'm gonna keep taking courses and spend my free time doing that. And so I just wouldn't give up that passion because I truly do believe that whatever you choose to do in your life, you want to be able to critically think that way. And I think the sciences help you critically think and analyze and problem solve in a way that's really important for whatever you do. The grade you said is really, it's really big, important yeah. that, that um, there's a maker's video I encourage you to watch of a woman who has in ultimately invented um, huge uh, breakthrough in insulin. I think it's vegetable-based insulins. Um, she was told that women don't do chemistry when she got a bad grade and actually ended up switching um, majors. So it's sort of that same, that same thing, like that confidence hits you and you think it's, oh, it must be all these messages is the reason, not just because it's hard and I'm gonna get a couple of these and these, it just sends you out. And so we have to figure out how to keep yeah. people in and not feel so alone. Yeah. But our, our son, our eight-year-old, is here, and he has, his teacher has this great sign that says in their class, it says, in effort, there's joy. And she wants all third graders to get powerful, that effort, even if you don't always, that, that that's joyful. True. And we need our children in their elementary school moments to have that feeling so they have the, the robustness to survive through uh, and debug the same. And uh, quickly, I remember at Singularity University, um, someone came up with a, a story about um, a classroom full of people, and the instructor said, what would you do in life if failure was taken off the table? You couldn't fail. 
And people started thinking about that. It's amazing what you would do, what risk you would take, what things you would invent and innovate it. And that's how it would start the course off. And so I would challenge you, don't be afraid of failure. Um, I, I have more fear of that on Earth than I have going off planet. <laughs> but then I think about, wow, I'm willing to step off into the unknown and float, and it really puts all of my fear here on Earth in perspective. Because when you allow yourself to fail, it's not that you've lost anything. If anything, you've opened up your opportunity for learning. Because failure just means you've become an expert at the edge of the envelope. That's great. Let's, I'm going to get, because I want to fix We don't have, only have five minutes. So quickly, quickly. So my question, I guess, goes back to the, the confidence issue. And I, you know, obviously, you guys are very intelligent women. This is a room full of very intelligent women and men. And I think uh, one of the comments that you get when you tell someone, oh, I go to Georgetown, or oh, I'm an engineer, or oh, I'm an astronaut, is, wow, you must be really smart. And at least for me, my gut reaction is to, to self-deprecate, to make some comment like, oh, not really, like, oh, they just kind of let me in. Um, but <laughs> so, so how do you own your intelligence and like be confident in that? How do you respond to that comment of, oh, you must can be I, so can smart? I just note, stop doing that. Stop doing it, okay? <laughs> because there's, I urge you all to see an Amy Schumer video about people complimenting each other. It's a bunch of women that compliment each other, and one goes, oh, you look great. And she goes, no, I look like, you know, a crack whore. I really do. <laughs> like, you know, and then she's like, oh, you've lost some weight. No, I'm really fat and pudgy. You know what I mean? And then one girl comes up and she says, oh, you look great. And she goes, yes, thank you. And they all kill each other. Like, they, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's hysterical, but it's, I can't stand it when people do that. You have, just stop doing that. It's just really, it has to stop. And I don't know how, you, you just have to you just know, will you yourself. Could, you don't have to, you could just say it's, it's super fun. You know, I just love it because it's fun. No, you, could just, you could just, like, deflect it. I don't know what you think if I you think don't want to own it. Brag bag, your assignment is for once a week for you to tweet or Facebook something positive about yourself. Right. Yeah. Do that every week. But it's super. And by the way, once you start doing it, it's easy. When someone, uh, sometimes people give me a comment, like, that was great. I go, yes, it was. <laughs> I did that today. Someone said, oh, you always uh, get there first. I go, yes, I do. <laughs> and, you know, and then someone said, oh, humble brag. I go, we I did it. I don't care. Like it was. Yeah, they were trying to bring me down with the humble brag. I'm like, I don't care. It's, it was fantastic what I did. Oh, sorry. Right here. Quick. It's a little tall. Hi. So you talked about this a little bit earlier, and I think it's great that Megan, you discussed a sort of positive environment once women do get into tech. But I know there was a recent New York Times article actually, kind of talking about how tech is Claire, sort of a Kane new piece. boys club in a sort yeah. of way with the whole like tit stare and that yeah, whole thing. Yeah, that was lovely. Um, so I was just wondering. I if, was there. Yeah, I was going to say, I was just wondering, obviously, um, as women who have experienced breaking into these fields, like what kind of challenges still remain once you are a part of STEM? Do you how do we keep women into it in these fields so? instead of, you know, it's great that there's a focus, I think, on getting them in, but how do you get them to stay? Uh, um, well, it, it's always going to be a challenge. I always say that when you're a woman, there's always the elephant in the room. And when you're a woman of diversity, the elephant is the room. So you might as well just clear the table, take out an extra, set up an extra teacup, and invite that darn ele elephant to the table. Um, it's there. And you acknowledge it. You deal with it. But only briefly, just to allow yourself to transition and move on to where your strengths, your skills, your wow factor is. When they say, oh, you're really smart and intelligent, I go, and you're a genius. So you just really roll with it. Um, it's always going to be there, but don't let it become the elephant in the room where it prevents you from being able to have your awesomeness move on and move forward. And just remember, if it gets to that point, that's their issue, and let them own it, and you own all yours and keep stepping on. Any instances of sexism? I mean, you know, I stopped reading the comment section when there's a yep. Positive Girls Who Code ar article that comes out. Yep. That's yep. sad. It like, is. how can you say something negative about teaching girls how to code? But invariably, there'll be a hundred comments of like, why do we have to do that? People don't give up power easily, period. And it, I wouldn't worry about it. Yep. Like, I hope you go into tech. I hope you start a company. You're going to face some sexism. Move on. Right, And by then, hopefully, we will have built you an army of women who are going to be there to support you but as well. Also, call it out uh, at the yeah. time. I was at CES a couple of years, couple of years ago, and they were like, Kara, we've got this whole initiative for women, and come and write about it. And I was at the Wall Street Journal at the time, and like, they wanted a prominent story. I walk up to the booth, and they had colored everything pink, <laughs> all the devices. And I, I looked at it, and they, they were like, here, we're trying to bring more women into technology. 
And I said, you've got to fucking be kidding me. And they, were like, <laughs> they were like, oh my God. I said, I am going to take you apart. I'm going to take this apart. I'm going to mock you, make fun of you in a national newspaper, and you deserve every second of it. And it was really, it was fascinating, but you have to say it. Like, no. Uh -uh. And when they do tit stare, that's the same thing. I was there. I was like, what are you doing? Like, to the woman who was actually running TechCrunch at the time. Yeah. And she's like, oh, it was funny. I'm like, not funny. Not funny, not funny, not funny. Like a little funny maybe, but not really. So we're working a lot on this issue. It's a really hard issue. Um, two things we're working on. One is visibility. So technical women and minorities are amongst the most invisible people because they're invisible in tech and they're invisible in women's stuff. If you go to women's stuff, there's not usually a steam panel. You guys are younger, so you're including this stuff. It's not usually there. And so we're working. We created something called Women Tech Makers. So for example, during Women's History Month, we caught, got. Uh, 10,000 technical women around the world to meet through the Google Developer events from Tunisia to Mountain View. Just get the visibility up so that they can get onto the stages working on Google I.O. We had a tweet off the New York Times last year, women, three women on stage at Google I.O., tech company first, question mark, and maybe it was. Like, think about all the different Apple developer groups, Facebook, F8, like women are on stage. So really pushing your company to get the technical women who are there and are awesome, so I call it bring it, so they're already there, so bring them into visibility. And then um, the second part of that is just debugging the advancement that's hard. It's the weight of history that's on us, so, and it's nobody's fault. We inherited this, but we have to like, systematically work on it. So we're doing unconscious bias on the whole company to just raise our awareness around the data points of what women and men do and what you can be aware of. What about conscious bias? Last question, I'm sorry, because they're giving me a thing. Okay. Sorry. Um, so I know, Kara, some of what you talked about earlier in your office hours was actually the idea that you and Megan have different styles, the idea mm -hmm. of giving away power once you get it, um, which creates more value and more power versus trying to grasp for something um, when you're already considered a minority in a field. Can you speak a little bit to balancing that with yeah. something like owning it and the idea of having it all and whatnot and balancing those things? I think you just said, we were talking about being genuine to your personality, and I'm aggressive and mean. So, and, I, and I've made it work for me really successfully in my career. Um, so I'm not, well, I mean, so mom, my mom's over there going, yes, she is. <laughs> what did I do? She was, then she'll, then she'll later, she'll tell you the story of how I was always obnoxious <laughs> since babyhood. But I take what works for you. I don't, I don't think you should, there shouldn't be a, you have to be a lean in Sheryl Sandberg type of personality or a Marissa Mayer. You work with what you're like. You, I mean, you have to work with your like or it just doesn't work. And so I happen to enjoy doing that to the CES people. It gives me actual pleasure to like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I do. I'm like, it, it, I, I'm, I'm indignant a lot of the time. And, I, and, I can, and I'm a good writer, and so therefore it's a dangerous situation for people who are <laughs> bullshit. Who are, and I like to call out bullshit, and so that, that works for me. And it also creates a, there's a fear factor of me in the valley. There is. There just is. People are like, oh, people are scared of you. I'm like, good. They should be. They sh if they're doing something naughty, yes, they should be. And so, um, so that works for me. Now, that is not always a, doesn't always work in, in life. But Megan, on the other hand, has a much more open hand policy, which is like she gives away power. She doesn't seek status or money or, or winning. You know what I mean, necessarily. Although she's quite, Megan's a very good athlete at MIT. She, ran, she did crew and swimming and everything else. So I never did that stuff. But I talked to, I mean, she does it a different way, which is a more peaceful peaceful way of yeah, I think you just have to be true to yourself. I don't know if you guys have the same sort of, um, yeah, I just, we were just talking about um, if somebody comes at me with some crazy comment and I'm super surprised, I, I'm the person who an hour later I think of what I should have said. So, you know, Kara's like right back at them. And I'm like, I wish you were there. Uh, but I, I think you just, you really have to be true to who you are. And uh, we really, um, there's some, there's people out there in these companies who want to solve these problems. And there's a whole lot of people who haven't figured out there is a problem still. And so we're evolving as a community, and I think in all the industries. Um, in the act, I brought this little quote that I, I forgot about this. Um, Chuck Vest, um, who ran the National Academy of Engineering, was an MIT president. And since we're on campus, he wrote this little foreword on a study around um, the conditions for women scientists on university campuses. And in this one little quote, it was the most reaction any, any MIT president has ever gotten of like every university calling to understand more. It was, I've always believed contemporary gender discrimination within universities is part reality and part perception. So after reading the study, but now I understand that reality is by far the greater part of the balance. 
and in that leadership that this president led and, and the president here, these, the world is changing. And Carrie, you opened this morning mm -hmm. saying how you know, Georgetown was really quite awful for women and gay people mm -hmm. you know, in the time when you were here. So I had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> But that, you know, just, it was just that the, the, the academic leadership was mostly blind to the, these people who happened to be running around. They were like completely just saw the boys, you know, saw the young men, and the young men had this potential, and they were just used to that practice. Anyway, and so I, getting people out of that practice, and there's lots of people out there who want to make this shift, and we're out there making these shifts. So I feel pretty I think good everyone about is, the question is like, there's an, the, Oscar Wilde is one of my heroes, um, and one of his best quotes is, be, be whoever you are, because everybody else is already taken. So, <laughs> so that's, you know, you just, whatever works for you and it gets what you want, that's the path you should take. Can May, you want to, I mean, May, I'm playing May Jemison for something. Um, uh, Yvonne, do you want to finish up? Uh, I know you're running out of time, so I thought I'd throw in my last sort of reflection okay. on this, because really happy to be here. But, you know, getting back to the elephant in the room, there's two cool things about the elephant in the room. One, everybody is at some point in the day is going to notice it. At the end of the day, throughout the day, the elephant gets noticed. You can't pay for that kind of advertising. You can't get better marketing than that. So run with it. Take it. And the other thing is that elephants have tusks of ivory. So remember, you are woman, you are extraordinary, you are awesome, and you lead with tusks of ivory. And don't forget, you roar. Great. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. That was great.